Paul has actually, at this juncture in the text, in this letter, he's turned towards a theme of unity in the church. And so what I, what I love about um, the book of Philippians is it has so many scriptures that we are all familiar with. To live is Christ, to die is gain. I know how to be content. I can do all things through Christ who gives me, who gives me, uh, gives me strength. Um, he that began a good work in you will bring it to completion to the day of Jesus Christ. There's so many beautiful scriptures. Um, the one we studied last week about Christ in this summary of the gospel, about he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. All of those are wonderful scriptures that we oftentimes quote, but we quote it out of context. And to be able to preach it as a series and put it in its right perspective, in its right context, even gives more meaning to us and how we can be applicable to our lives. And today, we have the same thing that is happening. And we're going to clear up some theological stuff today about grace versus works. But I think it's going to be, it's going to be something that will bless all of us. And so if you've got a Bible, turn me to Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Philippians 2, 12 through 18, it says this. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I want to pause right there before we read the rest of it. He says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I'm already perplexed because I'm trying to figure out. The pastor's been telling me that salvation is by grace through faith. So how is he telling me to work out my own salvation? I don't think I can work for my salvation. So what does he mean by work out my salvation with fear and trembling? That sounds like it's up to me. But here's what he says, for it is God who is working in you to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything, do everything, do everything, do everything. That means don't do anything with grumbling and arguing. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world, all of a sudden I heard the cash money, get your shine on song in my head. I don't know why that's stuck there. Verse 16 says, by, by holding firm to the word of life, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we have together today, God. We thank you, Father, that we get to worship you through the studying of your word. And so, Father, I just pray today that you would do something uncommon today. I pray that you would edify us today. I pray that we would see your son Jesus in a new way today, God. I pray that we would draw nearer today. I pray, God, that we would have a greater assurance in who you are and who you've called us to be today, God. I pray today, Father, that we would learn something that we did not know before, but because of what we learned, we, we pray today, God, that you would allow us, give us the strength to live out what it is that we now know. And so, Father, I pray that Christ would be made known today. I pray that Christ would be exalted today. I pray, God, that we will be convicted and encouraged at the same time today. So, Father, do work in our hearts, do work in our minds today, God. Be with us here in the sanctuary, God, be with us, God. Let, let your presence be tangible with us as we study and worship together today. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to overcome all distractions, all apathy, all disconnectedness that we may experience, God, because of what's going on in life. But, Lord, I pray that we would plug in today, God. I pray that today, Father, that you would plug into our hearts, God, that you would set our hearts ablaze today, God, to love you more, to pursue you more, God, to have a more fruitful relationship with you and through your son Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you today. We praise you. We honor you. We give you glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, amen. You may be seated. From the sermon series, Rebuild, today, our sermon title is God is up to something. God is up to something. Oftentimes when we speak of the gospel or we think about the good news of Jesus Christ, 
we tend to think of it from a perspective of something that has happened in the past and something that is still in the past. Now, is it true that the event of the cross and the resurrection is something that took place in the past in history? That is true. However, however, I want to tell you today that the gospel is not just something that has happened, but the gospel is something that is happening. The thing that happened that had an effect on our lives back in the past over 2,000 years ago is still having an effect and an impact today as we sit here in 2021. The gospel is not just something that has happened. The gospel is something that is happening, meaning this, that there are implications to what we say we believe and there are implications presently to what we say happened to us as a result of what Jesus did for us over 2,000 years ago. Last Sunday, when we looked at the life of Christ and the, the gospel in summary in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, we looked at the obedience of Christ and we looked at the humility and the humiliation and the exaltation of Jesus. We learned that although he was God, he did not count equality with God as something to take advantage of. But the text tell, told us last week that instead he took on the form of a servant in the likeness of humanity. And when he had became a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we learned that ultimately what that means is this, that Christ came not to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so for us, the practical implication for us was this, that in humility, we would consider others more important than ourselves, that we would look out for the interests of others instead of the interests of ourselves. We would do this by imitating the humility and the obedience of Christ. That is what it means for us to look back at Philippians 1 verse 27 and see what it means to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. And so here's the, 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 the reality of the fact that when Paul writes this letter, he tells them to live worthy of the gospel. In, in Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, Paul tells them this, but Paul realizes that to live out or live a life that is worthy of the gospel does not mean that you will live a life worthy of the gospel and it will be easy. To live a life worthy of the gospel means that you will have to live a life worthy of the gospel with everything going on around you, with living in a wicked world, with, li which li with living in a sin world with dealing with all of the elements that happen that come to distract us and take our attention away from God. We have to live worthy of the gospel in an increasingly dark and difficult world. And then you add in the fact oftentimes when we deal with persecution, we deal with life itself, we deal with things on the outside. What tends to happen is sometimes what happens on the outside has an effect on how we deal with people who are closest to us. And oftentimes, you know how it is, you come home from work and you are frustrated and you know you need your job so you don't go spaz out on your boss. But what tends to happen before you know it, you spaz out on the person closest to you. And so what is happening at work is having uh, implications on what is happening in your personal life. You've texted somebody before. You've called somebody before. You got on the phone with them. You were all pleasant and had your nice voice on, wanted to share some good news with them or kick the breeze with them. But all of a sudden, they were snapping on you, going off on you, having an attitude on you. And you're like, what did I do to you? The answer is you ain't do nothing to them. But what happened on the outside is affecting what is happening on the inside. And so he realizes this and he puts this in the context of the church. They're dealing with persecution because they're Christians. They're dealing with hostility because they're Christians. And he's saying, don't let the outside pressure and the outside persecution tempt you now to have internal disunity among yourselves. Because if it's hard out there and they're attacking us, but God has called us to turn the other cheek, typically we don't turn the other cheek when we get inside. And so he's calling them to pursue this idea of unity as if to say that living worthy of the gospel is not just an individual thing, it's a corporate thing. And oftentimes we think 
that how we interact with God on a personal, individual level is all that matters. But when God calls us to live worthy of the gospel, of the message we receive, God is also telling us to live worthy of the gospel has everything to do with not just how you deal with God, but how you deal with the people that are around you. God says, I don't want you to love me and hate people because if you hate people, that means that you actually don't love me. But if you love me right, then you'll love people right. And so he's calling them in the church to live and have unity in humble obedience to the example of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that he wants them to do is he wants them to work with what they already have. He wants them to work with what they already have. If you look at verses 12 through 13 with me, look at this. He says, therefore, my dear friends... Just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Before I get to that part, I want to deal out, deal with verse 12 and what he says to him about obeying not only in his presence, but also in his absence. And I think he starts off by commending them. He says, as you always obeyed, this church was a good church. They were not like other churches that Paul had many issues with and dealing with all the fighting and all of the immorality. This was a fairly good church. And so he commends them. But then he says and leans into their maturity. He says, don't just do it in my presence, but also do it in my absence. Let me make it plain for you. Don't have a substitute teacher mentality when it comes to your growth and development in the faith. You know what I mean by substitute teacher. You know what it was like when you were in grade school and you saw the substitute teacher when you showed up to school, your whole attitude shifted. You realize at that moment, I don't have to be disciplined today. I'm going to be lax today. I'm not going to read today. I'm not going to study today. For this hour, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Matter of fact, I know I get in trouble for conduct all the time, but I'm going to move my desk a little closer to my homegirl today, to my homeboy today. We're going to shoot some spitballs today. We're going to ball up some of them paper airplanes today. We're throwing them across the room today. I'm going to the pencil shop at 150 times today to I strap my pencil down to a nub today. I'm doing all that today because a substitute teacher is here. Now, that is a sign of the maturity of a grade school person. And what Paul is saying is if you really are mature in the faith, what is indicative of your maturity is not what you do while the teacher is present, but how you act when the teacher is absent. And Paul is saying if you obeyed when I wasn't there, now you need to obey that I'm not in your presence. He's saying that, that, that you, if you are a mature believer, it does not matter that you obey when the person who's in authority is in front of you, like your pastor, what really matters is what you do when they're not there because you forget that although the leader might not be there, God is always present. God, God is always present. And he's saying work out your salvation with fear and trembling because God is always there. You acknowledge that God is there. You, you revere God. You honor God. You're not afraid of God. Working out fear and trembling don't mean I'm afraid of God or scared of God, but I just don't want to disappoint God. I don't want to disappoint him. But he says, work it out. Work out your salvation with fear. Pastor, you've told us a hundred times that salvation is not by works, but it's by grace. It's by grace. So so, so what does that mean? I oftentimes look at Paul, what Paul says in Romans 4 and 5. Paul actually said, "But, but people are counted as righteous not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. And so our our salvation has already been paid for and purchased by Christ on the cross. We are already justified because of what Christ has done on the cross. And so salvation is not by works, but it's by grace through faith. It is also grace and not any works on our part. And so I love it. I love how Paul puts it in Romans 11 verse 6. I love what Paul says. Paul literally says in Romans 11 verse 6, Paul says, now if By grace, that is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. If you got anything to do with it, it ain't grace no more. Because grace is actually a gift. You know Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. We've said it a hundred times in this church. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from your works. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. You are saved because of God's grace, and therefore you can't take any credit for it. God has initiated our salvation, and by God's grace, he will complete our salvation. If you were here the very first week in the series on Rebuild, Philippians 1 and 6 says this, that he that began a good work in you will carry it on to completion 
Christian at the day of Jesus Christ, it means that if God saved you, God will keep you saved and see your salvation all the way through until the day of Jesus Christ. You are now just as saved as you will be on the day of Jesus Christ, but he's saying work out your salvation. You are as saved today as you'll ever be. You can't get no more saved. You know how we say, oh, they saved, saved. Oh, they real save. Oh, they are extra saved. You are no more saved today than you're going to be when you walk with Jesus when you're 80. But he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You are already saved from beginning to end. Your salvation is complete. But he says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Pastor, I'm still confused. I, I, I give you this example. The same couple that got married in 1991 is no more married than they are 30 years later in 2021. They were married in 1991, and they are just as married in 2021. But here's a caveat. If we tell a couple that is already married to work at their marriage, we aren't saying work for your marriage because they are already married as they ever will be. But if we tell them to work at their marriage, we are telling them to develop their marriage, discover more of their marriage, explore their marriage, cultivate their marriage, plumb the depths of their marriage, grow in intimacy in their marriage, keep growing to make it better and more secure, and even possess more fully of their marriage. If they got married in 1991, on that day, they didn't know everything there was to know about marriage, but that didn't mean that they weren't married. But from 1991 to 2021, there should have been some some growth in between. They should have discovered some new things about each other. They should have grown in their love for one another. They should have grown in their patience for one another. They should have grown in kindness towards one another. They should have grown in serving one another. And so when he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he's saying you are as safe as you're ever going to be, but there is more to explore in your salvation. It's more to explore. It's saying enjoy it more fully, more, more comprehensively. Discover more of what God has for you in working out our salvation and our perseverance and growth. We are working more toward a fullness of our salvation that we already have. No one will tell a couple that the day they get married that the work is done and over and there is nothing more that they should do. That would be to tell them to take the road to destruction. And it is the same to convince the church that just because we're here in the building together that everything will fall into place just because we believe the same thing. That by snapping our fingers, everything will be the way it should be. That would actually give us a false sense of security and put us on the road to destruction. But just because we already possess the same thing, does not mean that we don't have to work at it together. If not working at it is bad advice to a couple, it's bad advice to a church. And so the process between the not yet of your salvation, because you ain't always saved like you're going to be saved at the day of Jesus Christ when you get glorified, the process between the not yet but the already is called sanctification. And that's what he's telling them to work at. There's sanctification together. And just as a couple is working at their marriage to exemplify the love between Christ and the church, the same way the church is working together to sanctify itself as a bride in preparation for the consummation when the bride, when the groom returns to consummate his marriage with the bride. It is the same thing. And he tells them, to work out your salvation, live into it, walk out this sanctification. We tend to take this passive approach because we've been saved by grace, but just because we've been saved by grace don't mean we be passive because we've been saved by grace. The grace actually doesn't just save us, but the grace enables us to be who God calls us to be and do what God calls us to do. The grace is what allows us to strive for holiness. The grace is what allows us to pray when we don't feel like it. The grace is what makes 
makes us push back our plate and fast when we need more of God. The grace is what allows us to serve others in spite of how we feel. The, to, the, the grace of God is what allows us to constantly or uh, consciously live on mission in the world together. I love the way Dr. Eugene Peterson surmises this, this, this text. He says, be energetic in your life of salvation. Be energetic in it. Work towards it. Don't just be saved, but work at your salvation. But some of us have rested on our laurels, and we just want to make it in by the skin of our teeth. We don't care to grow in God. We just care that we're saved by God. But can I suggest to you that if you were just satisfied with just getting in, then it's a possibility and threat that you might not be saved in the first place. You may just be using God, but not be used by God. And this is what he's warning them of. He says, for it is God who is working in you both to will and to work. I love it. He says, it is God who is working in you. God is the one who is enabling us to do the things that we do as believers. God is working in us. If you are doing anything in the name of the Lord, it is because God is working in you. God is actually fueling you. God is energizing your life to come and show up week after week to serve the way you do, to love the way you do, to give the way you do. It's not you. It's God that is working in you. And when he says God is working in you to will and to work, what he's saying is, I love this. He's saying God is working in you to will, meaning God is actually not just saving you externally, but God has worked his way down into your will to recreate your will so that you would love what he loves, that you would do and desire the things that he wants you to do. You know it came a point in time in your life where you said, I will never do this. I will never do this. Some of you are in church today doing more than you ever imagined. Some of you are teaching in church and you never imagined you'd be doing this. Some of you are serving in a way that you never imagined imagine things that you did not want to do in the past, but all of a sudden now you enjoy doing. You know why? It's because God was recreating your will. It's not you that all of a sudden you just like, oh, I just love God. No, God created that love in you to love him and to do what it is that you do. God is enabling our activity and God is enabling our desires to do what he called us to do. And that means this, if I know that God is working in me, that means that I can walk in a spirit of humility and thanksgiving. Because it's not me, but it's God. God doesn't just rescue us from sin's condemnation. God rescues us from sin's control. And we've just narrowed God down to someone who saves us from sin's consequences, which is eternal damnation. But we've neglected to realize that God has also rescued us from sin's control meaning that you have more power than you think you have, meaning that actually as you grow in God, God can change those very desires that you have right now that are opposed to his will for your life. God is working both to will and to work in our lives. How many times have you said, man, I don't think I can keep going. Man, I don't think I can keep do it. Now, some of us don't do nothing, so we never had a conversation before. But, but, if you, but if you're here and you've been doing stuff, you've been grinding, it's got hard before, you've asked yourself the question, I don't think I can do this another week. I, 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 don't, think, I don't think I got another Sunday in me. But, but you realize you showed up, and the reason you showed up is not because you had willpower, but because God was working in you. And so when you get credit for it and people tell you, man, that was awesome, man, that was good, I love the way you served, I love the way you did that, you can say glory belongs to God because truth be told, I didn't have the strength to do this. I didn't think I had the capacity to keep going, but God is working through me, and so therefore God deserves all the praise and all the glory and all the credit in my life so if you see me work no it's not me but it's God who's working through me I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 I love what Paul says it's so beautiful Paul says I worked harder than any of them yet not I but the grace of God that was with me Paul doesn't even take credit for his own work and neither should we but this is not just a call for the individual it's a call for the church together to work together he's producing a life in us that is worthy 
of the gospel. And what he wants to do today is not just address the what, but he wants to address the attitude behind what we do. He wants to address our attitudes. He wants us to display love for each other, and he wants us to have a disdain for disunity. Look at what he says in verse 14, verses 14 through 16. Do everything. If you're doing the work, do everything. If you're being a believer, do everything. If you're living on mission, do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. He, he says do everything without complaining and arguing. I think Paul understood that with everything that happens in the world and having to deal with people, he realizes that the temptation to complain and argue is always present. I think he realizes that, that, that oftentimes a complaint is not far from my lips. I, I think he realizes that at some point, if you do life together long enough, somebody will disappoint you. At some point, the life group leader will make you upset. At some point, the way the greeter hugged you will turn you off. At some point, uh-oh, the pastor will disappoint you. Ooh. And the temptation is for you to start first murmuring in your heart. But eventually what's in your heart is going to come out of your lips. And when it comes out of your lips, it's not just going to come out into your lips into thin air. It's going to go into the ear of somebody else. And what he's saying is, he's trying to say, do everything without grumbling or complaining, because when you grumble and complain, you are really tearing up the fabric of the church, because oftentimes, when you complain to somebody else, you assume that they are as strong as you are, but the person you're complaining to may not be as strong as you are, and they may not be able to handle what you can handle. And so you're telling stuff, people think that you're frustrated about, not knowing that you're actually deterring them from growing in their faith and relationship with God. And we don't understand the implications of this. We don't understand that complaining, complaining towards leaders ain't just complaining towards leaders. It's actually complaining towards God. Because what you're saying is, God, yes, you saved me. God, yes, I have the Holy Spirit. God, yes, I have provision. God, yes, you put me in a church. God, yes, I have a, a, brother, a family of brothers and sisters. However, God, I don't like the way it's going. But do you know something? That if you're saved... Technically, you really don't have anything to complain about. And there's a difference between having complaints and concerns. Because you can have a concern, but complaining is different. And so when he says this, he's just not coming up with it out of thin air. When he says no complaining and no arguing or no grumbling or murmuring and arguing, He's actually looking back to the Old Testament and looking at Israel when they were in the wilderness. And if you know anything about it, Israel was always complaining when they were in the wilderness. Although God was providing manna for them every day of their lives and they had everything that they needed, they still could not overcome the temptation to complain. They were murmuring and complaining the whole time. And so when Paul says not mur to murmur and complain, Paul is kind of saying that you as the church are in continuity with Old Testament Israel, you are what they should have became. Because here's the thing you need to know about Israel, they were in the wilderness. God had brought them out of Egyptian bondage, brought them out of slavery, brought them out of the from the oppressor, brought them out of hard labor. He brought them from all of this stuff and brought them into the wilderness. And when they got in the wilderness, they started complaining that God had tucked them out of Egypt. This is crazy. They were in slavery, but because they were uncertain in the wilderness, they would rather go back to Egypt where it was familiar. Be careful when you long for Egypt when God has brought you out of it. They, they were longing for it. I think a part of Numbers, I love this Numbers 14 verse, it says, if only we had died in the land of Egypt. Only if we had died in the wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us into this land to die by the sword? Wouldn't it be better for us to go back in Egypt? What an insult to God when God brings you out of a thing and you long to go back to it. And here they are, complaining. And they're complaining to Moses. They never missed a meal. 
They have everything they need. They're complaining to Moses, complaining about their leader. And Moses says something in Exodus 16, verse 8, that I think would all serve us well. He says at the end of that verse, your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. That puts it in different, a different light. They thought they were complaining about the people who were serving them, but actually they were complaining against God. And so oftentimes when we complain or we murmur, we don't think that it has implications, but it does. Because you know what happens to the first generation of Israelites because of their complaining? They died in the wilderness. God promised them, you will never see the promised land because you, you complain rather than you give thanksgiving. Wow. That's amazing that God took complaining and murmuring so serious that it kept a generation of people out of the promised land that God had promised them. Because they couldn't be in control of the narrative, they complained. Because they could not have their way and God didn't do it the way that they wanted it to be done, they complained and they would rather forsake God's promises than humble themselves. And oftentimes we in the church can get in this habit of complaining about the pastor, complaining about the leaders, complaining about everything about the church, not realizing that your complaint is not against the person, but your complaint is actually against God. I got a better idea. How about this? How about in humility we learn to say, you know what? Maybe I don't know everything. And maybe the feelings that I have are not right just because they're my feelings. And we have to stop bowing down and worshiping at the altar of how I feel because your feelings may not be accurate. And let me give you another news flash. There is no such thing as a perfect church. As the old adage goes, if you find the perfect church, don't join it because you'll mess it up. And they just keep complaining in the wilderness. And I wonder, are you going to pick up and leave and go to another church every time something doesn't go your way? If you don't get your way, are you going to take your ball and go home? It always kills me when people have all the energy for their ideas, but when it's not theirs, it's not the same. And as I said last week, this is a call for them to have unity and maturity, saying this, that although I may not have my way, I can give it 110% because it's not about me in the first place. No one question changes at their job, but everybody question changes at church. But if you can have reverence and respect at your 9 to 5, where is the disconnect in the chasm when it comes to the house of the Lord? And we have to understand that we are all in this together. A critical spirit is not a virtue. It's a sin. And we have to be mindful. Man, I'm always complaining about everything. I'm never thankful. And what I'm saying is, all of us complain at times. I'm guilty of it too. But at some point, we have to be grown enough and mature enough to let our complaints turn into praising. At some point, our complaints need to turn into prayer. I'm complaining, I'm complaining. Matter of fact, let me be a solution and start playing, praying for what I'm complaining about. And this is what he's called them to, to have this unity, to work together, to, to, to let their conversation be gracious and attractive so that outsiders will come and want to be, uh, be a part of it. I love what C.J. Mahaney says. He says, God didn't call us to be a complaining church. He called us to be a proclaiming church. If all you do is complain about the church, or all we do is complaining about the church, why would an unbeliever want to be a part of it? And I'm not saying that there is not some reality that to be spoken or truth to be spoken. But what I'm saying is, if the overarching theme of your conversation is criticism, then maybe you have the wrong perspective. And this is what he's saying here. And he's calling them to live pure and blameless. Do you know that living pure and blameless means that what you say and how you treat others in the body of Christ matters to God? 
that it's important how we deal with each other, that it has eternal consequences to it, that, that it glorifies God when we encourage each other, that it glorifies God when we have good things to say about each other, that, that if we're going to pray for gifts, pray for the gift of encouragement. L- Lord, Lord, let me, let me see things in its proper light. Let me thank you for this church that you've given me. Let me thank you for the body of believers. No, things are not perfect. Things are not ideal. Things are not the way they should be or the way that I think they should be. However, God, thank you for putting me in a body of believers that I can actually grow together with. And th- This is what he's, he's calling them to do. He says, if you do these things, if you don't grumble, if you don't complain, if you don't argue, if you don't call everything that happens into question, you will then shine like stars in the world. I love this because here's what, what, I, what I love. He alludes again to Israel because God gave Israel their purpose when he called them as a people and their purpose was to be a light to the nations. Isn't it amazing that when we get saved, God takes the guesswork and we don't have to wonder what our purpose is anymore? Like, like that is so freeing that your purpose is not what your job is. That, that when you are, are trying to discover what your purpose is, it's not where you get your paycheck from. But what if I told you your purpose is actually how you represent God wherever you are. And so many of us, because we have, have brought into this idea that significance and value means that I have to have the right amount of money and the right job, we forsake and undermine the blessing that we have when God uses us right where we are. Jesus comes, and Jesus' occupation as an adult is not an executive of a Fortune 500 company in Israel. He's a carpenter. Now, if he can find value and redemptiveness in being a carpenter, surely you can find it wherever you are. He calls us to shine like stars in the world. I think it reminds me of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16, when he said, you are the light of the world, a city situated on a hill that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all those who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Jesus has redeemed us to be light in dark places. But the problem is some of us are trying to hide our light and blend in with the darkness. And he's called us to be a light wherever we are. And part of the way that we do this is to be Christ-centered and be other-centered. To look out for the interests of other people. To be content with where God has us on this journey. To take the time to say, thank you, God, for your provision in my life. Jesus says, if you would just, just come and be in relationship with, with me, I, I am actually the light of the world. I'm the light of the world, and anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If we are in Christ, and Christ is in us, we are the light. You have everything that you need, but God is calling us not just to do it individually, but he's actually calling us to do it together, that we have to hold on to our faith together, to hold on to the word of life together, that we grow not as individuals, but we grow corporately as a body. That means that we walk alongside of each other, correcting each other, loving each other, encouraging each other, allowing each other to be fruitful and to give attention to your brother more than you give attention to yourself. This is the life that he's calling us to, to let our light shine. Think about this. If everybody is looking out for the interests of the other person, we don't have to look out for ourselves. It is taxing to have to always make sure I get mine. It is It is draining. To have to jockey for position. To have to make sure that I'm seen. But if we do it the way that God has called us to do, we won't have to do that because we'll do it for each other. And if I see a body of people who are like that, and I'm on the outside looking in, I think that's attractive enough for me to want to be a part of. 
When people see your life, they should see a person that is humble and who is looking out for the interests of other people. Who's not looking to be served, but is looking to serve. But if we are doing that, know that we're never doing it by ourselves, but we're doing it because God is actually working in us. God is working in us. Paul saw this as his life. Paul didn't care that he put others on front street. Paul didn't care that he looked out, out for others more than himself. Paul says, this is my life. I am called to serve others even if it means that I have to give my life. And here's the thing. To give your life for your faith was not an unfamiliar thing back then, but it is for us now. Back then, they lived knowing that at any moment, I could actually die for my faith. But we're not even willing to be uncomfortable. We're not willing to be inconvenienced. But this is what God has called us to. Paul says this, then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you in the same way you should be glad and rejoice all with, with, with me. Here's the thing. Paul tied the effectiveness of his ministry to, what, to the way they were growing. Now I want you to think about that. Think about a parent. A parent does everything they can to make sure that their child has a fruitful and productive life. Oftentimes, unnecessarily, parents put their children, they wear their children's performance on their hearts too much. That they look at their child's productivity as a result of their parenting, either for good or for bad. If the child does great, the parent swells with pride and takes credit for it. If the child does horrible and makes several mistakes over and over again, the parent wears that and somehow questions in their mind, did I do a good enough job as a parent? And Paul is saying, as a leader, someone who has sacrificed his life to bring the gospel to them, I am tying the worth of my ministry to determine whether I ran in vain or not on the effectiveness and the fruitfulness of how you are as believers. I want you to think about that and st let that sit with you for a minute. For every person that has taught you, that has trained you, that has invested in you, that has spent time with you, they are looking at your life to determine how effective they were and if God was really using them to affect change in your life. I want you to think about that. As a pastor, I can speak personally. When I see somebody growing in the faith, I can't lie. I feel good about it. I feel good. I kind of get a little prideful. I kind of beat my chest in private a little bit. I'd be like, yeah, I trained that one. In the same way, when you see somebody that you've taught time after time after time after time, and you never see the fruit of it, that can be disappointing too. And I think there's some goodness in that that we should consider in our walk with God. We should consider the sacrifice that others have made on our behalf. When we get together in our groups, in our life groups, and we do life together, do you ever think about the sacrifice that your life group leader makes? to work their job all day, to prepare, to be able to lead and facilitate you and your growth in God during the week? Do you ever think of the labor that it takes for a minister to study countless hours up all night with no sleep to ensure to the best of their ability that you're growing in your faith? Can you think about the disappointment that you've had in your life when you've invested in somebody or invested in a relationship and you don't see any fruit in their life? It's the same way spiritual, spiritually speaking. And Paul says, even if I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I'll say this, I'm done. Paul is thinking back to the Old Testament sacrifices. On the sacrifice, the last thing that will be done to complement the sacrifice is that somebody would take some libations, take a little Ciroc, and pour it over the sacrifice to complement it so that it could be a pleasing aroma to God. 
And Paul is saying, you are the sacrifice. And my life has just been the compliment to complete the faith that you have. I'm just an add-on to your faith. And Paul is saying, I rejoice in being an add-on. I rejoice even if it means that I have to die. I rejoice in knowing that I played a role in your life and your growth and development. Most parents would give up everything if it meant that their child would fulfill their potential. Most parents would absolutely do anything it took in order for their child to grow up and become a productive and fruitful member of society. They would do anything. They would make any sacrifices. If that means they got to work two jobs, if that means they got to stay up late, if that means they got to go to parent-teacher meetings, if that means that they got to do homework, if that means they got to sit down and do discipleship, whatever it looks like, whatever it means, if it means they got to take the child to counseling, take the child to the doctor, to the dentist, I'll do whatever it takes because I want to see my child grow up and be productive. And he's saying, my life has been the same thing for your spiritual growth. But it doesn't end with Paul. Paul is simply modeling the sacrifice of Jesus who did not consider equality with God something to take advantage of. But he took on the likeness of humanity, assuming the form of a servant. And when he came as a man, he was obedient to the point of death. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a cross. And I think we model not just Paul, but we model Jesus in the sacrifice that we make for one another. This is what a call to unity in a church actually looks like. But I think that it extends beyond the church. It extends into all of our relationships. That even in a marriage, it is a call to sacrifice and to consider the other person more important than yourself. It it is a call not to make sure that you get everything you need, but to make sure that the other person has what they need. It is outdoing each other and showing honor. That maybe if we're called to shine like stars, maybe this is what we do at our jobs too. Maybe we serve people that we don't even have a relationship with. Maybe we go the extra mile, not just to do it, but we're doing it because we want people to see Jesus. What we're never doing in our own strength, but we're doing it in God's power because God is at work in us both to will and to work according to his good pleasure. God is up to something. Let us pray. Hey, I pray that you are blessed by the message that you just watched. The gospel always calls for response. And one of the ways that we respond to the gospel is through our giving. We respond through our generosity. God gave extravagantly to us by giving his son, Jesus. So when we give to God, we don't give to get something. We give because of what we've already been given. We've been given life through Jesus Christ, the son of God. And so we want to give today as a response to the gospel. We're not in the business of taking, but we are in the business of giving. The Outpouring strives to be a ministry that gives to those around us. We want to be a blessing to our community. And so you can participate and help us to be a blessing. And so today we want to invite you to participate in giving. You can give through our text to give at 407-305-2606 right here on the screen. Or you can go on our website, outpouringorlando.com. Click on the donate tab and you can give through our website. We just want to say thank you so much. We appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you real soon. Take care.